one trainer, you know, from our area, from Toronto, Ontario, man. We got Tony Wallace joining us, man. King of the kettlebells, man. He's a beast on those two, man. But Tony, how you doing? Not too bad. Thanks, guys. How are you guys? We're doing good. We're doing good, man. But just, you're new to the channel. Your first time on here. And, sorry, trainer of Tristan Brooks, who got a knockout this week and forgot to mention that. But um, definitely give everybody your background and how you got involved in boxing, man, just so we get a little bit of history. Okay. Um, yeah, I was born in England, and um, I started boxing in, in England at uh, Empire Sports when I was like 10, 11 years old, 10 years old. And um, that's when I started. My dad started me and um, had a few amateur fights, not many. And then I moved into uh, martial arts. So I got, I started my uh, karate there and I did Kung Fu. And then um, when I was around um, 20, I came to Canada and um, I continued with my martial arts. I was competing in uh, judo. I got black belt, uh, jiu-jitsu uh, and um I did my karate and stuff for uh, competitive. And then um, I kind of got a little bit old for competing, too much soreness and stuff. So then I said, you know, I'm going to go back into my my love of the sport of boxing and just coach. So that's when I decided to, you know, start coaching and it's been coaching ever since. Okay. And do you train in those other disciplines as well still? I train people in the other disciplines. Me, myself, I do a lot of kettlebells. So um, I started the first kettlebell classes in Toronto, um, doing classes about, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And um, that's why I got the nickname Kettlebell King. Not, not because, you know, I just got that name because my classes, when I used to do it, there was no classes uh, for kettlebells in Canada. So my classes were like 30, 40, 50 people sometimes at uh, Extreme Couture. And um, yeah, from there, I just got the nickname um, King of the Kettlebells. And I go around to schools. I do certifications with the kettlebells, stuff like that. And all my fighters, um, I get them using kettlebells too. Okay. All right. What's up, Tony? What up, man? My guy, man, definitely always wanted you to get on a podcast. Definitely have you here talking some boxing. Um, I, I definitely want to start here. I want to kind of recap uh, the fight of the weekend, man. Uh, you had, you know what I'm saying, your your, your student that you teach in the game uh, take on his second pro fight, you know, in true gladiator warrior form. Uh, talk to us about, one, how was camp for you um, and his how his reception was to the the training and the preparation and then obviously whether or not he executed what the plan was yeah you know uh for this uh fight because the, you know the first fight he um he did good he uh stopped the guy earlier than we uh expected but he did uh we were practicing that um uh, shot to the body the uppercut and uh so we said you know that's been a lot of highlight reels and stuff so Everybody's going to be expecting that uppercut again. So I said, uh, we'll work the uppercut to the head, and then we're going to work the lead uppercut. So that's what we did. And um, we do a thing called, you know, chopping. So we're doing the overhand, coming over with the shots after you throw the uppercut. So, you know, that's what we were practicing. And he uh, he executed it good. Like, he, he, he did it good on the second round. He, he dropped the guy. But the, it's tough Mexican, that guy. And, uh, you know, all, all, all respect to him. He got back up and then we went through the third round and then he started to box a little bit. I wanted him to, um, you know, display some footwork in this fight and work that lead uppercut and the overhand. And he caught him in, uh, in the last round. At this stage in uh, Tristan's career, uh, what type of sparring are you, you more... Uh, interested in him engaging in? Um, so this for this camp, uh, he went to Philly and he spent, um, uh, I think it was two, or two, two and a half weeks down there. He did uh, 20 rounds with uh, a 168 guy and uh, undefeated uh, pro. And um, he got 20 rounds in down there. That was like, you know, uh, three weeks before this fight and then he came back and just sparred with our regular guys here but you know i always i want him to spar 
guys who are, you know, higher higher level, they got more fights, they're in the pro ranks, undefeated. So he gets uh, a taste of uh, a real, you know, skillful, um, you know, athlete or opponent, boxer. I love it. I love it. Um, so, you know, speaking on that, uh, you got a lot of fighters that you're training right now um, yeah. who one day follow the footsteps, if not do better than what Tristan is doing right now, because you always want to do better than those who have laid the foundation for you. You know, yeah. that is showing true essence of I appreciate the foundation you laid because I'm a late better for the next people coming behind. But nonetheless, um, how are they taking in the journey and how are you using the pro experience to now pass it on into your amateur training? Yeah, so, you know, we have a, a club show coming up December the 3rd at Buda. And um, I got I think I got about four or five guys on that show on that show. And, um, you know, because Tristan already, he went first, he, he had a good showing. It just gives morale for um, the guys going into their fights as amateurs. Plus, um, he's always around helping these guys. So they get firsthand um, from him too, you know, not just me. He'll be in the ring with them. Like Tuesday, you know, he, he doesn't stop, right? He'll take a couple of days off from that fight and then Tuesday he's back at it again. And he's going to be helping those guys prepare for their uh, showing on uh, December the 3rd. Now, I have to do my job as a journalist and, you know, bring up some of the tough things that we don't necessarily want to talk about. But yeah. everybody is talking about it, so I have to bring it up. Um, the saying that Tristan right now is getting hit more than he should be. What do you attribute that to for us, the people, the fans, they are watching um you know for this fight um i believe uh the guy was tough um and tristan kind of knew that the guy couldn't really do damage to him so he was using his feet in and out he did get caught with a couple of shots but he was like pretty loose you know what i'm saying um he knew the guy couldn't hurt him and he was kind of just doing it for the fans in this in the fact that giving them a show you know what i'm saying normally uh if he's with in, in there with a guy who's a little bit more quicker or you know a, a little bit more dangerous in that sense he would have been a lot more tighter and not as um, loose as he was but for this fight the guy couldn't really he he, he he got caught a couple of times but most of the time he's he got out of trouble he was moving in and out with his feet. He was he turning off the ropes. Like it wasn't really an issue for me. Okay, and um, I'd like to know as far as Tristan next year, twenty three. Um, would you like to see him more active than he's been? Um, yeah, just to get more more experience. For sure, we got two fights booked already for um, February, um, um, next year. So we'll probably get, you know, four or five fights in next year, hopefully. Okay. I want to ask you something about your coaching style. Um, who do you, who were your mentors as far as like, you know, what you take coaching ideas from or certain techniques, if you could let yeah. us know. Good question. You know, I always give um, props to the older guys, for the guys who have been there before. And I always take from them. So... I'll take from, you know, in our own community, you know, guys like Dwight, guys like, um, guys like, um, he's in our gym there. You were just talking to uh, one of his fighters, Chris Johnson. Um, I take from these guys and other, other guys here in the community and on the international level, I'll take from guys like, you know, Floyd Mayweather's father, senior, um, Roger, rest in peace. And, um, you know, Stuart, I, I take from these guys, you know what I mean? I'll take a little bit and try to add it to what, what we have, you know what I mean? Zab Judah's father, he's very supportive with Tristan. So, you know, he gives me a little bit of advice too and tells me, okay, keep doing this, keep doing this. And that's, that's, that's how we've been doing it since he's been pro. I love it. I have to correct you on something, though. I, 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 ha I would be remiss if I didn't correct you. 
But uh, that was Trevor Thompson. Trevor is no longer with Chris Johnson. Oh, that, my bad. That, no, it, it, we're making it news to everybody that don't know. Uh, Shan is still with Chris Johnson, but okay. Trevor is with Eric Bellinger, I think he said, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to let you know that. Greg, continue, sir. Okay. So um, when Tristan goes down to the States, have you had the opportunity um, to go with him and um, just to see how he does against them? Or does he go down by himself? Yeah, so um, the first uh, for the first fight, he went down by himself for, with uh, uh, Zab Judah's okay. father. Okay. And he spent, I think it was two to three weeks down there with them. But what, what we do, if I can't make it, so for this fight, he went to Philly. And I was on my way to Philly. But they stopped me at the border, and they uh, they sent me back. Don't ask why, but they sent me back, so I couldn't make it. So when he's down there, though, those guys are very cooperative. So they, they always videotape his uh, sparring sessions. They send it to me. I look over it. I put my two cents in, and then he goes and spars again. So he did 20 rounds for in, in, in Philly. And I, I seen every round. And um, he sends the tape. We talk every night. And then I'll go over it and I'll say, okay, do this, do this, do this in your next sparring session. And he um, he actually executes pretty well. So even though I'm not there, I wasn't there the, the last two times, but still I will go down. I just had a problem at the border, but mm-hmm. that'll be sorted next time. Okay. I definitely want to know from yourself two questions. One, uh, what was that fight or fighter? That got you into loving boxing. For myself? Yes, sir. Um, Muhammad Ali, Pernell Whitaker, um, you know, those guys. I go back to the old school. So Jack Johnson was a big, big inspiration to, for me. Like I I read his story and everything, and that was huge. You know, I the old guys, man, Hagler, he was another inspiration. Tommy Hearns, Sugar Ray Leonard, you know, I could go on forever. So all those guys are inspiration. And in the new era, you got guys like, you know, Devin Haney. I like Shakir Stevenson. You know what I mean? These guys, they have uh, good technique, good skill, and they're locked in. And I like that with these, uh, with the new fighters. They want to fight everybody and anybody and, you know, show their skills. Uh, give us a brief insight, a brief foresight, a brief understanding of what it was like growing up in the UK. <laughs> okay, well, for me, you know, back then, you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, racism. There was, um, you know, a lot of um, Ku Klux Klang and stuff like that. So growing up as a kid, you know, we... Um, We'd have a lot of fights with these guys. And, um, you know, sometimes if you're on your own, you'd be running from them, you know what I mean? And when we're together. So it was uh, very uh, turmoil-like, you know what I'm saying? Very high tension in school. When I was at school, pretty much every month there was some fight in the park with different, they called them National Front back then, but they're KKK people. So it was like that when I was growing up, you know what I mean? So I love why I left England because I didn't want my kids to grow up in that same environment, you know what I mean? There was wow. two, when I was there, I I went through two riots there, lived through them. So it was uh you know, people won't understand, but it wasn't uh it wasn't the greatest. Now we understand that knife crime is pretty huge in the UK. Right now, now it's an epi- epidemic. Yeah. 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 Um, hopefully they can sort that out uh, uh, as soon as possible. But it's crazy. Kids are dying at a rapid rate. And you do see that definitely the disparity when it comes to uh, the racial issues is still kind of there. It's, I guess a little cleaned up, but, you know, it's still kind of there, so to speak. But um, I want to know what other sports did you play growing up, Tony? Um. I played soccer. We didn't play basketball. We played uh, soccer and cricket. Was the two. Uh... <laughs> uh, you talking to two islanders, baby? We... Oh, we played cricket, all right. 
So I, I, I with, with my father, he's passed now, but he took me to my first cricket. It was West Indies against uh, England. So and that was in that was in England, um, just around the corner from where I used to live. So yeah, my dad was into cricket, and I was I was mostly playing soccer as a young kid in school. Soccer, we did a lot of rugby too in school, which I didn't like, but we did it. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I, I wanted to know also, how do you feel without getting yourself in trouble about the amateur system in Ontario? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, with, with the amateur, you know, I feel like they could do a lot more for the, um, sport of amateur in boxing for in Ontario. I feel like um, it's a lot of politics. It's a lot of right, red tape, bureaucracy, a lot of favoritism. You know, I, I'm, I, I speak uh, straight. Like, I don't really give a shit. Like, who, you know, I just try to speak the truth, man. And, you know, I've been here in Canada with my amateurs. And, um, you know, there's a lot of favoritism, man. You could have a good guy. And if he's not in the right click with these people, he has to pretty much knock out everybody or to, 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 to get put on the Canadian team. Or he has to, now they got these rules, you have to go down to, you know, Montreal, Quebec and stay there and all, you know, like it's just, and um, I feel like, you know, now they now they, the kids gotta pay for everything. Like how, you, how they gotta pay for all this stuff. They pay their membership, if they fly them out, they got to be paying and stuff like how is these kids supposed to be doing this? You know, it's, it's almost like um, hockey, you know, well, back in the day, I know uh, in the eighties, they never had to pay for anything. They, they used to get funded so they could go to these places and compete more on an international level. Now they don't get no, they don't get much funding. So these kids got to take it out of their pocket and pay for this stuff. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm uh, probably not the guy to ask that question. <laughs> no, it's actually the right question because um, myself and Greg, we are definitely on a campaign uh, when it comes to correcting these gaps that yeah. Can Canada Boxing, Ontario Boxing is creating for us to have the real talent that we need for the world to see. Like we have a lot, of, we have a lot of club shows now. Like since the pandemic, there's been a lot of new boxing clubs. So we have a lot of shows every uh, every weekend coming up, different places. That's good. Um, I feel like they should have more, you know, international um, comp competition. Because the thing is, you could be good in Canada in this fishbowl, but outside of this fishbowl when you go outside and you got to compete internationally that's where the problem comes you know what i mean so you know for the last olympics and stuff like none of the guys went and then the, the, the ladies went and the ladies did good but none of the guys went right so it's like all those kind of things uh i, I gotta like um you know i they ain't gonna like what I gotta say, so I just try and keep quiet. I just train my guys and I tell them, you know, you gotta go in there and win undecisively. You gotta win like you can't leave it up to the judges. Simple. One hundred percent, Greg. You got any final before we get into the fi my famous questions for Tony? Yeah, you know what? Well, we gotta ask him. How do you feel about Ontario? This is in the pro ranks, just Ontario boxing and the rules, like same day weigh in and hand wraps. Okay, well, first I feel like now we have a lot more pro pro fighters and pro shows, so that's good. The um, the weigh-in thing, you know, I wish it was like the day before, but it is what it is. Um, now you can only use like one goals for each hand. That's a, a little bit of an issue, but, you know, I had a good cut man, so he was uh, used to that. You know, it is what it is. You just gotta roll with roll with the punches. Like we come there to fight. So even if they said one goal for both hands, like that's what we do, right? So it is what it is. But do you think it kind of puts us at a disadvantage, like you were mentioning on the world level, you know, where we're kind of behind, you know what I'm saying? Like 
yeah. you know, we can't attract big fights to come here. Um, yeah. And just, yeah, the guys are hurting their hands with, with that same thing. So maybe we should try to, you know, more people like you that say they're not really in favor of it. Uh, maybe we could try and get that change because we're definitely behind, man. I agree. I feel like we should be in part with the states. We're right next door. Mm-hmm. We should have the same similar rules, similar mm-hmm. weighing criteria. Yeah. Like, uh, just make it easier because then you could attract guys from the states to come here and fight. But, you know, some guys might not come because of that, because of the same day weighing, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. because of calls and all this stuff, right? Yeah. But now we got to give it up for Francis uh, and his world, world famous questions. Which is <laughs> hey, Tony, hey, Tony, before you before you go, just don't forget um, American amateur boxing, they wrap their hands with tape and gauze. Which is that's that, what I we should start there. Yeah. Yeah. We need to start there. <laughs> We're still using cloth, you know, but this another story. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely uh world famous questions. Uh when you are doing your workouts, your personal workouts, what type of music are you listening to if you're listening to music at all? I like, um, you know, hip hop. I like, uh, you know, the old school Tupac, Biggie, you know what I mean? I, I, I favor that when I'm doing my workout, you know? So as, as a coach and a trainer, as a coach and a trainer, what is your favorite boxing drill and what is your least favorite boxing drill to do with your fighters? Uh, when they're preparing for a fight or just yes. training? W- w- Give me both. So, like, just training. I like to give my guys a little bit of variety. So I'll do, like, your traditional pad work, throw the right hand, jab, cross, stuff like that. And then I, I like to add in, you know, like I said, I take from the older the older coaches like Roger Mayweather. So I do a lot of Roger Mayweather pad drills. I really love it. I think it does help. A lot of people just think it's um, just for show. But I find I see a big difference with with these guys' um, punch combination and um, punching. So they punch more. They got a uh, smoother hand. So it's not just for show. A lot of these people think it's just for show. These pad drills, what like Floyd does and stuff, it's not for show. There has a proper uh, meaning to it and an application. But a lot of people don't understand. They just see it. They feel like, oh, this is just for show. Yeah, it looks pretty, but it increases hand speed. It can it increases flow, it, it, and it, it's good for the fighters instead of just always hitting the bag. And then you got an extra element to bring to their training. You know what I mean? So that's that's what I think. Um, for me, I mix it up. I'll do the pad drills, one, two, one, two, three, whatever, the regular old school, hit the bag and stuff. But I also add in that aspect of it, the, the mid flow. You know, and uh, as a trainer now, as a trainer, you could give me when you used to compete. But as, as a trainer right now, uh, when you're having boxing shows, what would be your pre-fight boxing meal that you would have to get you in the right groove? And what would be that post-show guilty pleasure, like win or lose? Like I got to have it as soon as the show's over. For me, or for them? For you. For me, I would tell them to have something light, something like salad or something. No, no, what would you eat? You, for the people that want to know, as, an, as another coach out there, what do coaches eat before they before fight time? I just eat light. Like, I just have, uh, I myself, I just have one meal a day anyway. And um, so for fights, uh, I just eat light. Sometimes I don't even eat before the fight. I'll just have fluid. And then after the fight, I'll go and have, you know, I, I'll have a, a nice meal. So after his fight, I went and I had, um, you know, steak and lobster. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Tony said, like, I had some steak and lobster. Guilty pleasure, baby. <laughs> I love it, man. That's what it's all about, baby. Yeah. Steak and lobster. <laughs> all right. Next is, uh, if you were a superhero, Tony. What would be your superhero power? Black Panther. Woo, Greg, that's the first time we heard that, no? <laughs> the Black Panther. 
Yeah. I absolutely love it, man. Uh, we definitely appreciate you coming through, sharing some knowledge with us. Uh, we look forward to seeing the progress of uh, all your fighters, uh, including your pro fighter, Tristan Brooks. Uh, definitely put on a performance uh, for the world to see. First time on the zone. Um, and definitely uh, looking to see more of him, more of you. We definitely see you this weekend. And, you know what I'm saying? It was on the zone. And, you know, he was the only highlight real on the zone from the whole show so it couldn't have been that bad oh that's facts <laughs> man we definitely appreciate you man we look forward to talking to you even more and again uh with everything greg um you know what to do yeah man definitely thanks for coming on and listen the door is always open we'd love to uh, pick your brain another time man but thank you thank you guys respect all right take care peace there you go, ladies and gentlemen, man. With the one and only Coach Tony Wallace, man. King of the kettle.